Welcome. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Uh, today I'm going to unbox chapter 2.5. Uh, oh. Okay, so the first thing I have to say, which I'm gonna have to repeat in five minutes when people get out of bed, is that some of you have emails from me that you haven't replied to. Uh, those of you who are in the room, uh, you've gotten a chat message from me that it seems you're not seeing. Um, trying to check if there's anyone else. So, um, okay. <clears throat> so, started, I pulled names out of a bag um, and I messaged some people to defend their homework orally. And you should really reply to my email to schedule that because if you don't, then you don't do it, and then you get a zero, and then you lose 10% of your grade. And you don't want to lose 10% of your grade because of this. That's just silly. So, some other things I want to say. Um, I want to say, um, I don't know if you've noticed, I think some of you haven't. But if you go on grade school, if you go on grade school um, and you look at the homework that's already been graded, uh, you go, this is the homework I submitted. I didn't do much. You can, so you see the points you got, but you can see what you got points for in each question if you click on it. Well, I didn't submit anything. But here you would see um, comments if there's any, which it's likely that there are because I wrote a lot of comments. And here you see the whole rubric. So you can see all the things I was giving points for. Uh, and the ones you got, I mean, you see this, but that doesn't mean you got all of these. Um, the ones you got, got have a tick next to them. So this one is blank. So it has blank. Um, and, you know, you should check in your own interest to check to see if I if I graded your things wrong, which I might have. It's the first time I use Ray Scope. Um, so the other thing I wanted to tell you, which I told you on an email the other day, is that I put this thing where if you look at the grades, uh, so Moodle, I made it so Moodle uh, pretends that every grade that you don't have yet is a zero. That way, if you ever have a surprise, it's going to be a good surprise, which I think is better. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, I don't know what grades you're going to get on things. But if you have a guess, you can go compute your average here. Um, I, I think this works, I hope. So just, you know, enter numbers in there and then like I said at the beginning of the year, uh, this is your minimum letter grade that you get. There might be a curve that works for you if things work. You can also enter um, enter uh, your homework grade here to get the average in there. Uh, and that's all there is to it. Okay, so let me double check, see who's here. Anyway, um, I mean, if I can ask a favor from some of you, if you're in that, um, if you're in that group chat on Snapchat, can you please tell people in your class to reply to their emails? Um, if they have an email from me, just check your emails. It's, it's very important. Like, there could be important stuff there. Like, what if a professor goes like, hey, here's how you can have like 50% worth of points of extra credit if you reply to this email and you miss that. Doesn't it worry you? Anyway, if you if you don't reply to me, 
you're gonna lose your grade and you're gonna basically drop a letter grade so you should really reply to me all right so math so last thing i said on friday uh, we're still talking still in section 2.3 and I mentioned the squeeze theorem. The squeeze theorem says that if you have three functions and one is between the other two, so there's a function that I don't know much about and two functions, that, but I know it's between two functions. Uh, and then the, the function I don't know anything about is in between well, if I know that at some point the limits of the two functions agree, this means that the limit of the, the two functions on the endpoints agree. It means that the, the one in the inside has to have the same limit. What's it an email that everyone received or just certain people? It's an email that just certain people receive. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm deciding randomly who gets to present each week. Uh, so eventually you'll get the email. Um, it says, hi, luck for the study. You're going to present your homework this week. Please tell me which time you can meet with me on Zoom this week. Also, if you, you know, if you're here, you've gotten a message on chat from me right now saying, oh, you're here? You've got an email from me, the person I just wrote to. And you as well. Please check your email, people. Oh. Okay, so. <sighs> Look at the chat if you've gotten a message. Okay, so the squeeze theorem. So you have two functions, and if you have a function you know nothing about basically, but you put it in the middle of two functions that you can compute the limit of, and that limit happens to be the same, then you know that your middle function, first of all, you know it has a limit, second of all, you know what it is, uh, you know it's the, uh, it can't be anything else, but the one limit that they that the other two functions agree on. So um, um, so the example I didn't get to do on Friday uh, was this one. So um, this is a typical example where you use the squeeze theorem because, uh, well, what happens if I, if I try making x equals zero? What happens if I try making x equals zero is that x squared um, becomes just zero. And then I have sine of one over zero and well, this, this stuff is not defined. Um, so I don't know what to do with it, but even, you know, even if I said um, it approaches infinity, well, what does this even mean? Um, not really, there's basically nothing I can do with this. So um, with, with Vince, this, with Vince. Um, so what I'm gonna do um, is minimize the program. So what I, what I wanna do 
is is find two functions that fit in here. Um, hopefully with the same limit. So, and you know, hopefully since I get to choose the functions, I'm gonna try to make my life as easy as possible. Um, and my goal is to get easier functions, not more complicated ones. So, um, okay, I'm trying to find a bigger thing and that's, um, I mean, that's hard because basically, because there's a lot of possibilities, there's a lot of bigger things. Um, and probably most of the, most of the choices are not going to work. Uh, so we have to be smart. We have to be a little bit lucky. So, um, one thing, okay. So the problem that's preventing me from solving these problems as we told you about is, is clearly the sign of one over X. Or maybe just the sign, because if there was no sign, I would be able to do this problem. Um, so what can I do with sign? What do I know about sign? That could make this, uh, like, like, that could be useful. That's a question for you. What do you all know about sign? Specifically, what do you know that could make it um, easier to say it's more, it's smaller than something or bigger than something? For example, like Matthew's pointing out, um, sign is one over cosecant. But I feel like I know more things about sine than I know about cosecant. So this is probably not very useful. Unless you happen to be a cosecant expert, which I think nobody in the world is. Um, opposite over hypotenuse. Okay, so maybe arc sine. Um, I mean, those are all true. One problem I have is that I don't know what to do with them. Um, so, what is sine smaller than or bigger than? What's bigger than sine? There is nothing bigger than sine. Can sine get as big as you want? Um, is sine bigger than every function in existence? Two sine. That's a, well, that's true. That's true if sign is positive. So if, if for example, between um, zero and five, not two pi, between zero and pi, because this is sign, uh, between zero and pi, sine of x is bigger than zero. And if you take a positive number and you double it, you get a bigger number. Um, of course, if you take a negative number and you double it, you get, uh, you get a smaller number. But over here, um, you have that two sine is bigger than sine. Two sine looks like the vertical stretching of sine. 
So since x squared is positive, I can multiply this inequality by a positive number to get the same inequality. So I have my function and it's smaller than something. I'm not gonna call this f. It's smaller than something. The problem is that this is as hard, this is equally complicated. So we didn't do anything wrong. We just didn't do anything very useful. So, so if you look at sine, what's a graph that is always above sine? So what is a graph that is always in, in this region? So as a hint, it's a very easy function. Parabola, easier than that. What's easier than a parabola? Linear, well, okay, it's linear. Which, uh, the which line is it? Which line is above this wave? Y equals one. Y equals one. Who was that? Okay, I didn't see your name, uh, but you were exactly right. Y equals one, yeah. Uh, where's Y equals one? It's horizontal, it's Y equals a constant. And and it's right here. Um, the sign is bigger than one. I feel like you need this. Um, you just... Um, your mind wasn't too complicated things. For no matter what number you, what number uh, you give me, the sign is equal to, to one. If I tell you I computed the sign of an angle uh, I got, and I got 2.5, you know I'm lying or I did something wrong. Okay, so that's the, so one is a function. It's a function that for every number gives me one. Uh, what is sine bigger than? It's bigger than negative one. It's bigger than negative one. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Um, because again, if I tell you sine of x is bigger than, uh, if I tell you a sine of an angle was negative five, you would say that's not true. If I ask you to compute the arc sine of negative five, you would say I can't do that because no angle has sine negative five. And the same for the cosine, right? The cosine is always between one and negative one. If, since it's the opposite over the hypotenuse, like Serene was saying, um it's gonna i mean at least for for angles between zero and pi over two um it's always dividing one of the longer sides of the triangle but one of the bigger ones and if you take a fraction where the denominator is bigger you get a fraction um smaller than one so we know that we know we, we've been able to sandwich sine between two easy functions. How do we sandwich the original function between two easy functions? Well, um, we, can, we can take this inequality and multiply by x squared. And why can we do this? We can do this because x squared is a positive number. This is so important because what happens when you multiply an inequality by a negative number, if you, have, um, you switch, you, you switch its sign, it goes the other way around. What if you multiply by a number where you don't know if it's positive or negative, 
uh, then you completely mess it up because you don't know you don't know what happened anymore. You don't know if you got a, a bigger than or a less than. So I don't know if you can tell that I find this important. I don't know if I'm using enough colors. Well, I don't have enough colors. Um, just remember, if you have three bigger than two, which you know is true, you multiply by negative one and you get negative three bigger than negative two, which is not true. But again, multiply by x squared because it's positive. Um, so whenever you see an inequality and you multiply by something, you have to be you have to be worried that you will be multiplying by a negative thing. I mean, honestly, I I make this mistake all the time. But if I did in an exam, I would be in trouble. In an exam, I would be very careful not to do this. <clears throat> okay. So, so this is our sandwich. Um, I've always called this quiz theorem the sandwich theorem. So I have a function here that I think will exist here. These two functions will exist here. And I know, I proved that um, for any x, um, my function is in between these. So if I have the limit, if these limits happen to be equal, then, then I'm done. And these limits, well, the the power law tells me that I tells me that I can just plug in. Why why can't I write? Um, so this limit is zero squared. This limit is negative zero squared. Uh, both limits are equal. Uh, so I'm done. The squeeze theorem. The squeeze theorem tells me that the limit I'm looking for is, um, oh, that's the wrong function. Oh, yeah. What am I doing? Um, I said, let me, let me fix that. <laughs> okay, so the, the squeeze theorem says that the limit of this function is zero, which is fine. It's all, this is all correct. But the question was asking about the limit of, um, the limit of a different function because I already knew. The, the squeeze theorem was asking about this one. The, the problem was asking about this one, which I didn't do anything for. So let me go back. Um, what I meant to say was sine of anything, including well, sine of y for any y, for any y, this is true. So wh wh why don't we, why don't we make y the thing that we want to put in there, which is one over x. So sine of one over x is between negative one and one. It's the sine of something. So it has to be between negative one and one. And then I multiply by x squared. I notice that x squared is uh, square, so it can be negative. And mess this up for me. And then I get this. And now I have that the limit of, of the functions on both sides are equal. And they're so the squeeze theorem, like I was saying before, says that the limit now the function of in the middle, which is the function that I actually want to compute the limit of, is uh, the same as this limit. 
And there you go. So this limit is zero. <clears throat> All right. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, really? Do you have any questions? You don't have like. A I have a question. Yeah. So is this like specifically only when you do sine one over x, or when you have sine one over x? I mean, no. Basically, anytime. The thing is, this can work anytime that you can think of functions uh, that. This anytime you can think of functions that fit in here, this is gonna work. I mean, it's only gonna work if the limit exists because that's the only thing. This doesn't tell you when the limit doesn't exist. So if you think that a limit exists and you can think of functions uh, that you can prove are one is bigger and one is smaller and you can find their limits, then you can do this. Um, in practice, if you have something like a sign, that's um, that that that's a good indication that uh, that makes using this easier because sign is very easy to bound because we know it's bigger than negative one, smaller than one. So if you see signs and cosines, they're more likely that this is going to work or that this is going to be easier to use. But I mean, in principle, you could use it for anything, you know. I have a question too. This is kind of more just like a question about like problems we'll have with this. If we're given like squeeze theorem problems, is it more likely that like they're going to give us the two um, the two functions that like, and we have to like figure out the squeeze function or like do the opposite like what we did right now, if that makes sense. Uh, what we did right now. Because that's what, yeah, the answer is, is the second thing. Normally, you would see you would see a function that you don't know how to do the limit of, and then you have to figure out to use the squeeze theorem first of all, and to and to find which functions to squeeze it between. Uh, I didn't write any logarithms; they're all H's. Okay, so um, let me draw the graph again. So this was a function. Sine of one over x does a lot of crazy things, but then turns out you multiply it by x squared and that x squared makes it uh, go to zero because x squared is getting too small. And whatever crazy things sine of one over x is doing by itself, um, don't matter if you multiply them by something very small. And the thing that we did was say, look, it's, it's between these two parabolas. And anything that fits inside of these two parabolas has to go to zero. And I think it's pretty convincing in the picture. <clears throat> Any, anything I could draw between the two blue lines has to approach zero at x equals zero. Okay, so the squeeze theorem, it's hard to use because bounding things is hard. Um, because the thing where there's no guarantee that you're on the right track until you're done basically. You write a bigger function, but then you're not sure if it's going to work or not. And also, there's a lot of things you could try. You could say sine of x is smaller than two, two sine x, like we tried, and it just doesn't work. And then you have to try something else. Okay, so 
anyway, that's the end of section 2.3. Next section is 2.4. Wait, I have a quick question. So if, if that's the case, are we going to get like hints on the test as to what the other two functions are? Uh, that depends. I mean, for example, if I give you a function with a sign or a cosine in it, and you're supposed to use that it's smaller than one, uh, I wouldn't give you a hint for that because I, I just did a very similar problem, you know? Yeah. If it was a more, I think, I mean, if it was something I, I think you would have to be lucky to come up with, then I would give you a hint. So we're skipping section 2.4, even though it's very interesting. So section 2.4 is the precise definition of a limit. And I mean, it's very interesting, but also very time consuming and very confusing at first. Um, and not the most practical thing in the world. I mean, it helps you. I mean, with it, you can prove everything we're saying about limits. But that's just not what this course is about. Um, and also, college students tend to hate that part. So I guess maybe you're lucky. But if you wanna, if you wanna read through it and ask me any questions you have, I'm very happy to answer them. So uh, that means we're moving to 2.5, which is continuity. So continuity is something that happens to a function. Um, so let me tell you what a continuous function is. Um, you say a function f is continuous at x equals a if f of a equals the limit of f as fx approaches a. So, so you take a function, you take a point, you take a number, a, and what does it mean to be continuous? It means that the limit equals the function. So basically it means that you can find the limit by, by plugging in, which as we've seen so far, it's true. It's true most of the time, most functions you run into are continuous uh, at most points. Um, but it's not true, so it's a useful concept, especially because once you know a function is continuous, you know that the limit is just compute by, um, by plugging in, which is our dream. Right, because that would make all limit problems just like pre algebra problems. So, just to clarify this um, this definition, there's three things that need to happen, and if one of them fails, then the function is not continuous. Um, f of a has to be defined. If f of a is not defined, if a is not in the domain, then the function cannot be continuous there. The function cannot be anything there. The limit, uh, the limit at the point has to exist. Again, a thing that doesn't exist, I can't say if it's equal to something else or not. And sounds like philosophy. And these two things that have to exist have to equal each other. So if one of these things doesn't work, um, then the function, at least one, I mean, if, if three fail, then if all three of them fails, then it's worse. Um, I guess we would say it's discontinuous at a. So um, 
let's do some examples um, and draw some graphs. <laughs> Where is um, this function? x squared minus x minus 2 divided by x minus 2. Where is this function continuous? So where does this function equal its limit? So the question, the question is from which axis? Oh. Two. So for two, it's continuous, or for two, it's discontinuous? Or just saying something happens at two? I have a question. Yeah. Do we simplify it first, or? Uh, my good. What do we do to simplify it? Factor out the top. Okay. So, sure, let's try it. So, if I want to factor out the top, um, let's see, minus b plus minus root of uh, b squared minus 4ac, that's a 9 divided by 2a, so 1 plus minus root 9 divided by 2, it's either 1 plus 3 divided by 2, 1 minus 3 divided by 2, um, that's negative 1 or 2. So this is x minus 2 times x plus 1. I know I did this right because negative one, uh, negative two times one is negative two, and their sum is negative one. Okay, so um, so this is the function. Now, um, does this mean that the function is equal to x plus one? Well, yes and no. This is true if x. Uh, is not equal to negative two. So, because if I, because f of two does not exist, f of two is not defined. F, f of two is zero divided by zero. That's that's not anything. So. Um, so the answer is that if x is not equal to two, this this function is continuous. As, well, this is easy to see that the limit, for example, as x goes to three, uh, x plus one is four by the limit loss, and this is equal to to f of three. The, the one for the sum, for example. Um, not for example. So, and, and if x equals two, f of x um, is not continuous because it's not even, um, it's not even defined. Because um, how can I say that the limit equals a function if the function doesn't exist? The answer is that I can't. Um, so 
What does this function look like? x squared minus x minus 2 divided by x minus 2. Um, well, it looks exactly like x plus 1, uh, except at this point at 2 where it's undefined. So really, it looks like that, but it has a hole in there, uh, which is what I'm going to draw. <clears throat> So the function looks uh, exactly like, um, like I said, exactly like the line, except there's a point where there's no line. Um, and basically, this is basically what discontinuous functions look like. They have jumps or gaps or weird things. And things that you can draw, well, continuously are usually continuous functions. Okay, any questions? So is it not continuous or is it continuous? Well, the question was where? And the answer is at some places it is, some places it isn't. The answer is that it's continuous if x is not 2 and it's discontinuous if x is equal to 2. I guess altogether I wouldn't say it's continuous because if I say it's continuous I mean it's continuous everywhere. And my answer was not everywhere. My answer was everywhere except at x equals 2. Okay. So like, uh, would we put that in interval notation or we just say it's continuous if x is not equal to 2? I don't, I don't care. Anything, anything that is understandable. For example, what I wrote here I think is understandable. Like, this could be the answer, you know. The answer doesn't have to be a formula. Uh, you want to write, you want to write it like this? This means every number except for two. This is, I don't know if, where you would, where you would learn this, but probably at some point in your life. The, this is set difference, or you could write it like this. Everything smaller than two, union, everything bigger than two. All of these are fine. <clears throat> including including just writing a full sentence. Which, you know, if you're doing your homework and you're going to get confused with interval notation and you're going to write wrong things, maybe it's better that you write a sentence. Yeah, yeah. In, the, yeah. in the homework, is there going to be is like, like questions where we have to put in a specific notation? No, not really. But, I mean, as a rule, basically, I accept anything that I can understand. Which I think is just a good rule for life. Try to make things, you know, it's about communicating. If people can understand you, then it's fine. If they can't, then it's not. Okay. I get those knees. Okay. Um, okay, uh, next example. <coughs> there it is. Let's see. Uh, so these are the examples in the book. Um, so this function is defined in two pieces. It's defined by this formula, if x is not zero, and by it just returns one if x equals zero. So, um, so again, the same question: Where is f continuous? Where means for which? Access. The point is, your answer has to say, the answer somehow has to cover every number. If I, you know, uh, here I said, here saying either x is not equal to 2 or equal to 2 covers every possible number. That's the only thing that matters. Okay, so here there's a clear point where things are going to go wrong. 
uh, which is x equals zero. I mean, if they're going to go wrong somewhere, it's going to be at x equals zero. So I guess if x is not equal to zero, um, this is going to, I mean, it's going to be continuous. I'm not going to, um, go deeper into into this because um, I mean it's applying the limit loss but also I'm gonna we're gonna learn things and make this very very fast but the thing is if I'm asking you where f is continuous you can't just tell me what happens at x equals zero you have to tell me at x at x not zero it's continuous because I'm asking you about every number you have to say something about every number so you can't just forget to say that. Um, so what happens if x equals zero? Well, uh, the the function so f of zero when x equals zero, the value of the function can be found here. Uh, it's um, it's one. So the question is: Is the limit going to be going to be one? So to find the limit, uh, I've said this a bunch of times, the limit, the limit doesn't care about x equals zero. It looks close to x equals zero, like x equals 0 0.003, but all of those points are not equal to zero. So their value can be found on this line here so this limit is the limit of the function one over x squared and this is the limit we've already done if you have a a number that is very small its square is going to be either smaller and then one over that number is going to be uh it's going to be a huge number and they're going to get bigger and bigger this function uh, approaches infinity so in particular, the limit doesn't exist. Since um, this limit does not exist, the function cannot be continuous at uh, x equals zero. Because for it to be continuous, the limit would have to exist and be equal to f of zero, and that's not that's not happening. <clears throat> so so that's it. Um, because so how do I know I'm done? I'm done because I gave an answer that covers every number. If if the number is not zero, then I covered it here. If the number is zero, then I covered it here. Is that every number? Is every number either a zero or not zero? Yes. So uh, that's it. <clears throat> so this function, what it looks like is, well, it has an asymptote at x equals zero. And uh, then at x equals zero, it, it goes through zero one because f of zero is one. So every every x coordinate has a value, but uh, also again, it's a function you can't draw without lifting your pencil from the page, which makes it not continuous. All right, are there any questions? So x equals zero is not continuous because it's just one value. Do you mean because that point is there by itself in the graph? Because every every point in a function has one value. Um, so it looks. I mean, it, um, judging things from pictures is a good idea, but it could. Uh, deceive you, but if you see a point floating around, if you see things like jumps, that tends to mean that a function is not continuous. Uh, so Matthew's uh, question, what's the answer in interval notation? I guess the answer is that 
f is continuous um, in here so for x this means belongs to all the numbers smaller than zero and the strictly smaller than zero and all the numbers bigger than zero also um, this is also interval notation or if you just say what's the set of all the points where it says continuous where it's a set that contains one element which is zero <laughs> 